Don't get me wrong, it's still plenty at stake. Florida needs a win and BCS points for that day. In Atlanta with the winner of the West, yes sir. And for Coach Sook to further ease the pressure. And FSU's had a good year indeed. The natives are quiet now, but you can bet they still need a win. Over arch rival number one is always bumping up. It's another game they would bump a K. Sunshine State lives up to its name, but boy, is it chilly on a Thanksgiving weekend here. A lot of students have now returned to school to get ready for the arrival of the Seminoles this afternoon in the swamp. For us, it's a milestone, the 100th time we've taken college game day on the road. And it's something we are very proud of. We thank you for watching over the last 10 years. It's Chris Lee and Kirk. And guys, for Roadshow number 100, kind of a parallel to Roadshow number one. It's Florida State in November on the road. Now that time in 93, they lost to Notre Dame. Oh. I'm just saying, you know, but I, I don't know nothing. What I'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing if these once mighty Gator football fans can rally their troops again. You know why? The last two times we've been here against Tennessee and Miami, the Gators lost. That's now, right. I say nothing. You start rally the troops. Rally the troops. Get them rally the troops. This is the biggest game. A lot of other big games on the field, but Kirk, you got some news off the field today. Well, later this afternoon, the University of Arizona will have a press conference and announce their new head coach is Mike Stoops, the defensive coordinator for the Oklahoma Sooners. Now, Mike will continue to coach at Oklahoma through the Big 12 championship game against Kansas State, and then the day after that, report to Tucson and become the head coach, put his staff together, and start to recruit. How that will affect OU in the national championship will be very interesting because he will not be there. He'll become a consultant to help them out. But Mike Stoops to Arizona, congratulations to Mike. And when he makes up his staff, it'll be very interesting as well. Yes. More guys could be in right. He's got some work to do. Arizona closing out a losing season by losing to ASU yesterday. As for the BCS contenders, speaking of Oklahoma, they're part of that four-way chase for the Sugar Rush. You gotta go to K-State's backyard, try to become the first back-to-back -back Big 12 champion. They likely could survive a loss and still go. More on that in a second. USC visits, or has Oregon State visit next week. Troy spent on the weekend scoreboard watching. They could use an FSU win here. LSU is gaining ground, heading for the SEC title game. They would ideally like to meet Florida for their BCS help and for payback when their only loss. And Michigan's got to hope the Trojans and Tigers are upset next Saturday. They're in the clubhouse with a nice consolation prize, the Rose Bowl. Here's the race for number two, that BCS decimal point chase. Remember, the lower numbers are better. You can see the polls for free USC. The computer gap is narrowing with LSU. The strength of schedule will certainly narrow some more. And that quality win deduction, very important. LSU having .4 taken off for beating Georgia. Yesterday at home, they clobbered Arkansas. 7-3 game before the Razorbacks began to self-destruct and LSU just turned it on. Boy, that was the best all-around LSU performance I've seen in years in every single phase of the game, you guys. Matt Mock was really sharp, Kirk. Well, the, the Tigers' defense has been dominant all year, but now you're starting to see their offense catch up. Matt Mock comfortable in the pocket. He had open receivers, especially in the second half all day, and he's able to capitalize. 55-24. I mean, you got to begin to look at LSU yep. a little bit more seriously sure. now. This decimal point chase is going to tighten up. And as we know from a couple years ago, when Nebraska slid in over Oregon and Colorado, games off the radar screen can have a big impact. Even games off the mainland. Alabama's <laughs> an LSU victim. Hawaii is a USC victim. The Tide are four and eight. A ninth loss would hurt LSU. Every little bit counts. The Rainbows, seven and four, headed for the Sheridan Hawaii Bowl on their home field. Other games affecting LSU's pursuit especially Georgia, Georgia Tech. That's the most crucial game. Georgia destroyed Tech last year, but Tech is sitting around waiting for an upset. 
Quality win deduction, very important for LSU. But don't forget Louisiana Tech, Kirk. They're an opponent. They host four and seven rice and rice. You mean to tell me we were at week 15 <laughs> and we have to watch the result of Louisiana Tech and rice to find out who's going to go to the Sugar Bowl? It, it matters. Oh, it matters. Of course, the sunshine showdown here. LSU pulling against the Seminoles and for Florida. Again, uh, ideally, they'd like to have Florida in Atlanta next week. Playing Georgia would not kill them. And Kirk. No. Don't forget TCU-SMU. Now look at that. SMU lost to Louisiana Tech, who lost to LSU, and we got to watch 0-11 SMU to see what they do today. I you, don't, you don't have to watch. Well, okay. Here's the wish list for the Bayou Bengals as they try to draw closer to USC and to BCS. They need the Georgia win. The Florida over Florida State game would really help them. Number three is tricky. Kentucky's lost 18 in a row to Tennessee, but then that would certainly help them. I'm an AP pollster. I'm telling you, I'm not going to immediately have an overreaction and say LSU's got to be ahead of USC. That's right. You're no, that's right. Good. But I think a lot of pollsters might look at that if LSU wins impressively next week. Let's say L yeah. USC doesn't. I think the polls will still hold 2-3 USC. The computers are the question. Well, as we come down to the wire, LSU is taking advantage of an opportunity. The whole nation watched them yesterday. They made a statement. Really, they've made a statement for the last three weeks with impressive wins. So I think they have closed the gap. Let's talk about USC for a second. We really don't know how good the Trojans are because of their schedule. All I can tell you is in watching them every week, they have, they have the most athletic and balanced offense in all of college football, no matter who they're playing. And their defense, when healthy, is just as good as anybody's out there so USC is still the number two yeah. team but LSU Chris is right they've closed the gap to make voters maybe kind of yeah. look at this next week let's take a look at the number one team though Oklahoma I think Oklahoma is gonna have the toughest game in years when they play Kansas State for the Big 12 title I'm gonna tell you why number one the weather there could be lousy cold sleet any kind of bad weather is an equalizer number two Kansas State is hot they won six in a row but here's the important point I think if Oklahoma loses to Kansas State, they don't deserve a shot to go play for the national title. Even if they don't win their own conference, they shouldn't be going to play for the national title. Well, they thought about instituting a rule. Yeah, happen, of course, did. with Nebraska, didn't even win its own division. They, they decided against it. that. But we think the math might work out that way, Lee. They could lose and still go, number two. You don't like it. No, I don't. Right. You don't win your conference. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have a chance to sell it. Well, later on, we're going to don those beautiful blazers of the bowl reps. Here's an example right, right now. Oh, That's the Tositas nice. Festival Blazer. Looks very good. Oh, right. Good. Looks Looks perfect. On her. <laughs> we'll go through the bowl selection <laughs> process. It'll be a little bit of fun. Other storylines on this college football Saturday. More on the fight to the finish in the SEC with Georgia and Tennessee and Florida. Somebody's got to win this SEC East. The Big East factors into the three boot BCS bowl games. Pittsburgh and Miami Tennessee it's going to be very chilly in Heinz Field. And as far as the Heisman race, you know the main contenders. Are we forgetting anybody out there? And of course, the complete story on the Gators and the Seminoles is toss up here in the swamp. Come on back. Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. And in part by... Regular Wireless Championship Tech Challenge. You can be on your way to the BCS. The question this week, which team has been the most dominant over the past decade? Now, you got to go back 10 years. Nebraska didn't make the list. They've had three titles that go back a decade, but the choices are Oklahoma, Miami, and the two teams here, Florida State and Florida. But what makes the Gators Seminoles rivalry so special? Geography, for one, they're only about 150 miles apart, and closeness equals contempt for some of these players. It's hatred. For all of them, though, it is pride. For Florida, a quarter century of winning seasons seemed to be in deep trouble until a five game winning streak. Four times when the opponent scored first, three times by less than a touchdown. Only one of them was right here. The Gators can cap a great turnaround with a win today. Florida State has already clinched the ACC title in the BCS Bowl bid. They'd like to get a 10-win season. They want to prove the program is back. Bobby Bowden says it's been lovely, quote-unquote, this week, not to have the spicy banter with Steve Spurrier. But make no mistake, the rivalry remains. Nobody outside of Florida State cared about it. When we first came here, Florida didn't care. You know, we were the doormat that beat us 10 years in a row. And so, but now it has, now that we've won some, it's like anything else. If one team beats another all the time, there's no, no rival. But one team starts beating the other and it starts getting equal, then it's a rival. 
Well, guys, it's not all the time, but FSU has won four out of the last five, and these Florida seniors know they are one and two against the Noles, and they do not want to finish their careers one and three. Well, you mentioned a very good point there. I think the Gators have a huge, I mean huge, psychological advantage over the Florida State Seminoles. The reason why, Florida State has already accomplished two of the major goals. They won the ACC, and they got a bid to the BCS, and that is tough to keep your focus after getting to those two goals. Now, the Gators, on the hand, they need this one. If they get this one, they get a beautiful game on New Year's Day. The Florida <laughs> Gators need this game. Well, you're right. Middle edge oh, advantage, Florida. Florida. If we, but if we would have had game day down here five weeks ago, we probably would have had 10 or 15 people show up. The Fire Ron Zook website was cranked up. Florida was 3-3, three and three, coming off a humiliating loss to Ole Miss right here. They're getting ready to go on the road to Baton Rouge to take on LSU with a 3-3 three and three record. Great time for a young team to quit and mail in the season, right? Wrong. Three and three, they beat LSU. They turned it around to win 19 to seven. And since that point, they've gone on to win five straight games. And what a great way to finish things off with an impressive win against Florida State. I'll tell you this right now. You better get your shots in on Florida this year because the way they're going to recruit with Ron Zook and with a young quarterback in Chris Leak, the Gators are the team of the future in the SEC. See, we turned them around. They were booing you for a while. Well, they that's misunderstood what I was saying. That's all right. awful. You, you know what? Awful. Senior day, we saw the emotions in Columbus and in Ann Arbor yeah. the last couple weeks. That could be a factor right here. The SEC East race for Atlanta. You see the BCS rank. It's important because that seventh tiebreaker goes to the BCS standings. You toss out the lowest of the three. If the other two are within five, and they will be, then it goes to head-to-head. -to -head. But the biggest challenges today definitely are for the Gators and the Dogs. Tennessee, of course, has to visit Kentucky. BCS bids on the horizon. We talked about our bowl selection process. We'll break out the Blazers and whoa. wind out for a disappointing season. Where does Coach Willingham go from here? We'll have recruiting news coming up. Clobbering a and behind Cedric Benson. Well, I think this is what Mac Brown has wanted to see from his running back all year. Remember, he was suspended against Baylor, and from that point on, his average close to 200 yards a game. Can't give that offensive line enough credit. Boy, they're playing well. 283 yards Woo. for Benson. We'll have the Longhorns Bowl scenarios coming up a little bit later on. For their take now on the surprise and disappointment of the season, you go to the studio, Speed Drills, Reese, Trev, and Mark. Guys? It don't hurt that coach anymore or his family. Then you have to. I had that happen to me. Do it with class and dignity. I think he's How do you fire first. a guy with class and dignity? I, mean, I, mean, I know it matters how call you handle him in, it. Right? But, call him in. Yeah. You call him in and let him determine how he wants to leave. Stay tuned for that story. Meanwhile, dignity and class, they know very little about no, that sir. at Auburn these days. I'll tell you, think about this. William Walker, the president of the school, two days before they play Alabama, sneaks up on a booster's plane, <laughs> lands in Indiana, across the river, meets with... The guy who was the offensive coordinator at Tuberville a year ago, Bobby Petrino, who doesn't tell his bosses he's meeting with them, he's got to apologize. Auburn's got to apologize. The governor scolds the president. I mean, that is an absolute embarrassing mess. Well, let me tell you what I think about that situation. Auburn people who snuck around and tried to find a new coach with the old coach back there should be embarrassed. And what a perfect example for your families on how to live your life. Yo. <laughs> well, now, with Alabama's probation on NCAA and their coaching fiasco, and now the state of the Alabama's two major football programs, listen to this, is a perfect example of everything that is wrong with college football that's going on in the state of Alabama. How tough is this? Auburn beats Alabama, and they're the ones that they are embarrassed the week after. Oh. The big thing to me for Auburn is they have to take ownership of their football program yeah. back. It's, it's time for one booster to be put aside as far as making decisions with his deep pockets and his sensitive ego with these head coaches. I think the Auburn football program, the only hope they have is for a group of people to make decisions and not one or two people. Amen. Tuberville should stay. It's kind of up to him. You, you think he'll oh, absolutely take the money stay. and stay there? Stay, stay and keep <laughs> the like? money. Hello. In the SEC, there could be on the verge of an historic hire. There has never been an African-American head football coach in the SEC. Sylvester Crooms thought to be the leading contender at Mississippi State. He's the guy that played under Bryant at Alabama, was an assistant there. He spent the last 16 years as an NFL assistant on five different teams. I feel like John Clayton are these days. Yeah, Mississippi, State, Mississippi State did meet with Sylvester Crooms. They talked with him and his family. They're going to find out today. They offered him the job. They're going to find out today whether or not he will accept it. 
foot should find out today if Mississippi State has a new coach. And looks like right now the meeting went very well. That Sylvester Croom will be headed to Mississippi State. Wow, and that would be history. Trying history. to rebuild that program certainly down there. You know, negative climates in recruiting certainly have not helped at Auburn and Nebraska. They're both projected as major disappointments for the class of 2004 by ESPN.com's Tom Lemming. It's especially fragile at Nebraska, which has always had to import out-of-state talent to compete at the highest level. But Tom's number one projected disappointment is Notre Dame. Now it's still early, but only one of the Irish seven verbal commitments is rated a big time stud player. Others, they're behind in the chase, I know it's early, UCLA and Ole Miss. As for the leaders, Tom says just check out the top of the polls. Success in 2003 will translate into recruiting success in 04. The top recruit is running back Adrian Peterson. The best back out of Texas since Billy Sims and Eric Dickerson is favoring Oklahoma. If Peterson heads to Norman, he'll join fellow Texan quarterback Brett Bomar, who's already heading north of the border after having committed to the Sooners. USC should be right behind Oklahoma, receiving a commitment from Jeff Byers, the nation's top offensive lineman and best center out of high school in 20 years. Traditional recruiting powers, Miami, Texas, and Florida State round out the projected top five classes. Florida will be a close sixth, with Michigan, LSU, Tennessee, and Ohio State all having strong classes to round out the top ten. Other impact players include Brian Brom, brother of former NFL quarterback Jeff Brom. Tennessee is his front runner, followed by Notre Dame, Louisville, and Kentucky. Michigan received a commitment from quarterback Chad Henney, who shunned local favorite Penn State in the process. Ted Ginn, the nation's best defensive player, might be defending passes against Henney next fall. He's leaning towards the Buckeyes of Ohio State. Looking for a sleeper? The projected top five classes that might surprise you are Pittsburgh, Alabama, Stanford, Texas A&M, and Oregon. The Ducks, that makes two oh, right. fans who have found their way to Gainesville very happy. <laughs> maybe, maybe something else is making them happy, I don't know. But it, it, I don't know if it's because of or in spite of the uniforms that Oregon is recruiting well. <laughs> You talk about games like this, though, yeah. Lee, backyard rivalries. How important are they to recruiting stuff? Well, I'll tell you, I have a good background in this situation. I played high school football in the state of Florida. I played college football in the state of Florida. I coached in the first Florida-Florida State game ever. And winning this football game is very, very, very important in recruiting, particularly this year for Ron Zook. You know why? Because he's a good recruiter, but he's never beaten Miami, and he's never beaten Florida State. Ron Zook needs this game for recruiting. I think in rivalry games within a state, you're exactly oh. right. What happens in this game has a big impact on how things will go in February. But I think as far as recruiting goes in general, it's not so much about playing time and a chance to win in the direction of a program. You know what kids really look to? NFL contracts. Which program is sending players to the, to the NFL in the first round? If you're a quarterback, you're looking to find out which, which team has a quarterback that has a chance to be a first round pick. And chances are, those are the schools that are going to be able to go out and bring in top flight recruits. It's all about the NFL. It's all about the future. And it's all about me. That's what these 18 year olds are thinking about. Under that criteria, who's the clear winner lately? Miami. I mean, Miami. Nobody has sent more first-rounders to the exactly. NFL. That's right. Yep. Miami. And they've been the recruiting champs in this state, and they've been the state champions on the field this year. These exactly. folks don't want to admit yep. that. That's true. Yeah. Right. We'll see. Coming up, we're going to talk about the Dogs and the Yellow Jackets, the Hokies and the Cavaliers, and, of course, plenty on the Gators and the Seminoles as Bubba Sparks resets the table for the second half. You got to say white in the lead for the Heisman because the Sooners got the Sugar Bowl on the horizon and LSU or USC's a worthy adversary for them in the big one come January. But Larry's Gotta be the best player in the land If that's what it's about Then put the Heisman in his hand Especially if he rips the hurricanes apart But Perry's player play could cause a vote to change a heart If the dogs beat Tech Let us see a rematch Of the two best in the conference Relax his back Then who's going bold And we'll know in a minute The wildest year since the BCS was implemented Close. All right, Close. coming back, we'll have a Heisman Trophy opinions. Close. Guys, be careful. Bob Seuss might be watching the show. You know what he thinks of Heisman Trophy opinions. And also right here, we've got Tunnel Vision, where these guys say games can be won or lost before you even take the field. Stick around. Your top five Pontiac high performance plays of the NCAA. Here's your ball game, folks. There's Rudy. Look, uncorks the deep one for the end zone. Phelan is down there. Oh, he got it! He got it! He got it! Far 
drops back to throw. Under pressure, scrambles right. He's going to throw it as far as he can down the field. It is tipped and caught by Tillman. Tillman at the 20. Touchdown, USA. Colorado just needs a touchdown. Time has run out. Stewart throwing it to the end zone. The ball's in the air. Caught. Pontiac High Performance Play at ESPN.com slash Pontiac. Saturday morning with us. That was the record crowd at Lincoln a couple years ago when Notre Dame visited. Almost 16,000 turnstile count. Here's the count of campuses visited. And with this show today, Florida ties Michigan for the most ever visits by a game day road show with eight. You know, whether it's the swamp or the big house or almost any place, there's a sacred place and a shared ritual each Saturday. And Lee and Kirk have snuck down there to explain. Guys? Well, Chris, we're inside the sacred confines for many college football players coming out of the tunnel, getting ready to see all these fans. And for a lot of players, and speaking for myself, you realize that this is the end of the week. The emotions are finally coming together. Players get excited. And this is the reality of college football coming out of that tunnel. You know, Kirk, what I really want them, I want them excited in that tunnel, but I really want, when they hit the end, wow, I want them out there screaming and yelling as fans say, gosh, this team is ready. Oh, the emotions. Yeah. And nothing compares to the emotions that no. are coming out of that tunnel. No. All you gotta do is look in the eyes and look at their momentum in the state in the tunnel. And it's just a bunch of guys getting ready to go to war. That joint that pumping, everybody yelling, slapping each other around. And it's just just riled up, man. We just get fired up, man. We just, huh, just ready to hit something. Get the ass on the one of the most emotional journeys in college football takes place away from the field before the ball is even kicked off. After each team leaves the locker room, it spends the waning moments before entering the stadium in the tunnel. There's always someone starting something, a, a chant, or uh, someone always talking and getting you fired up, and you're, you're always in there. It seems like a little too long. Somebody has started a chant up, and they'll say, where my dog's at? And the other team would go, yeah. And he would be like, where my dog's at? And we'd be like, woo hoo. Where my dog's at? Yeah! Where my dog's at? But not every player uses the tunnel as an emotional springboard. I think as a quarterback, you don't, you don't get to stuff for uh, games like like defensive players or, or people that you know make big hits or anything. So as a quarterback, you kind of keep it a clean, calm, you know, slate throughout the whole game. It was pretty, pretty intense, guys. You know, yelling and screaming. I'm not one of those. I, I kind of try to be focused and, you know, I, calm. I guess that's that's the word I like. Uh, you know, for me before a game. Occasionally, however, the tunnel can be a dangerous place. When I was at Oklahoma, Coach Switzer got run over. He fell and he got run over by the team. I said, okay, I've learned my lesson. When I become a head coach again, I am not getting out front. And one day when the smoke just kept on going to like the middle of the field and you could not see nothing. So I don't think nobody ran to the goalpost because the goalpost was right there, but it was, it was thick that day. While testimonies from the tunnel differ, many claim something spiritual occurs underneath the stadium. Everybody huddles together and you just feel everybody's aura. It just seems like everybody's spirit and everybody's soul is just in you at that time. And as soon as you get out of there, it just comes out. It's an experience that really sends chill bumps up and down your spine. You know the smoke's getting ready to happen. The crowd is out, 80,000 people, and, and you have your team behind you. The Ibis is there, and they're all there. And just, just so, uh, they're so charged up and emotional, ready to come out of the smoke and, and ready to play the game. It's, it's a, it's a life-changing experience. Now watching that feature brings back so many different emotions coming out of the tunnel. It's just, it's yeah. electric. And, you know, one one time that we were playing Wisconsin in Madison, one of the toughest environments yeah. in the Big Ten, we came out of the tunnel and the state trooper held up the riot gear and he said, <laughs> gentlemen, I suggest you keep your helmets on. Good stuff. I put my helmet on. I'm thinking, what are we going into? People are banging on a cage. We walked out. I got hit with a tomato, with eggs, oh. marshmallows. And I, I think that was probably the most intimidating atmosphere. Oh. We really got us charged up. My favorite is four. 
45 years ago. As a young assistant coach, I came out of that tunnel right there onto the field as a young assistant coach at Florida State for the first Florida Florida State game ever. The Gators beat us 20 to 7, but we gained respect because they played us and we had an identity. What a moment. I can still, ooh, it came up. You guys are ready to go, right? I can came feel up, it right now. Came up a little bit short. Yeah. But like you said, for the Florida State program, you guys won the war there 45 years ago. Yo. Unbelievable. <laughs> Chris, there's nothing like the tunnel. You guys, that was good preparation for getting ready for this show right here. They got a terrific big screen presentation right here before the Gators come out of the tunnel. It gets the crowd really ready, but I have a question. Who was that guy leading the Hurricanes out of the tunnel? I mean, he's pumped up. I don't know who he is, but if he doesn't get run over, he's going to be ready to play. Send Lee an email if you know who that is. We'll talk Knowles and Gators and Heisman straight ahead. Get after Chris Leak. But Leak's protectors, especially in the left side, are very experienced. Chip game, the other three bowls are represented here. It's dangerous to make these assumptions, but you can't have anything begin without the projections that... Oklahoma will knock off Kansas State. They'll be number one. And the UCA, USC is also Nokia's Sugar Bowl bound by being number two in the BCS. I know it's a dangerous assumption, but if that happens, this is the selection order. And the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl will select first, sir. Well, on behalf of John Junker and the Tiesta Bowl, <laughs> Tiesta Tostitos Fiesta Bowl Committee, first of all, we'd like to congratulate Bob Stoops and the Oklahoma Sooners. Love to have them come into Tempe. We wish them well in the Sugar Bowl. And losing Oklahoma, we're going to stay within the Big 12 Conference and welcome in Mac Brown in Texas. What a wonderful story. After losing to Oklahoma <laughs> to win the rest of their games to go 10-2, and two, we'd like to invite Texas to come to Tempe to be that first selection. Mr. Fiesta Bowl, as Vito Corleone said, I'm going to make you an offer you cannot refuse. Me. I want Texas in the Rose Bowl. I want them. In. If I don't get them, uh, I have to take Florida State if they beat Florida. All right. On behalf of the FedEx Orange Bowl, we look forward to hosting the championship game next season. And we will declare that Miami, as the projected winner by a two to one vote right here, projected <laughs> winner over Pitt will be the Big East champion. Miami will anchor our bowl game, stay right at home, sell lots of tickets. So, so Miami to the so FedEx Orange I, you Bowl. You know, I, I guess looking at my options, and there are two great options. You have Ohio State still out there, and you have the SEC champion out there. I think we're going to look at the SEC champion. Under this scenario, we would take the SEC champion, Texas would take on possibly LSU or Georgia or Florida or Tennessee. I got Michigan, Florida State in case. Oh, Michigan, Florida State. Okay, well, the Orange Bowl will get the ball. They would like to have Miami and Ohio State, a rematch of oh, last year's good. championship. Good that would be stuff. pretty good. That's Again, good stuff. That's the that's scenario, scenario okay. with, with the favorites winning. But there's right. a lot to go. Give me yeah. what you think. Well, well what well. I think will happen, I think the big game is going to be Pitt and Miami. Right. Whoever wins that game will affect everything. I think if Pitt's able to win that game, I think obviously it allows him to move in there. Chris, why don't you break down? You think Miami's going to win, so what do you think? Well, I think that if Miami wins, the Orange Bowl will take him and they'll get Ohio State in that, in that very coveted rematch. And that would send Bowden to the Rose Bowl, right? That would have some great games up there. I See, I think Pitt beats Miami, and because of that, I think that affects everything else. I think the Fiesta Bowl takes Texas. I think the Rose Bowl then will get the SEC champ, which means the Orange gets Florida State, Pitt, and the Fiesta Bowl gets Texas and Ohio State. That's my projections. And that, I'm going to tell you, this in a country song. This is my story, and I'm sticking to it. Texas goes to the Rose Bowl, then i got to arrest of those guys wherever, wherever they, they want to go. They I'm go. just saying Texas, Michigan, and the Rose Bowl. Bowl, this is the and that's that's why I got this patch on right here. Forget about the national championship. He just wants Michigan Tech. Patch. Right. I'd like to see a Taylor, but in the meantime, we've got <laughs> Saturday selections here. Toledo and Bowling Green follows us in just a few minutes. How do you oh, see the battle going, for the Mac West oh, championship? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm going with we're in a hurry. Josh Harold at basketball season has started, so all the Kentucky fans are happy. <laughs> Tennessee beats Kentucky. Tennessee. Enough said right. there. Georgia, Georgia Tech. Now, I want to be, you'd be perfectly clear when it's your turn, all right? I'm going with Georgia, and I can't wait to hear who you're going I was setting you up in a meeting. I was setting you up out here. I think Tech, with the defense, will beat Georgia. I like Georgia Tech's defense. You can't Upset. lose. Virginia and Virginia Tech. Who I that already one? said it. Virginia by field goals over Tech. Kevin Jones, so Brian fast. Randall, Virginia Tech with a big win over Virginia. And the game that will affect all three bowls. And if you just tuned in, we're wearing the blow bowl rep blazers for a point here miami and pittsburgh in pittsburgh i think it's cold and i think it's ugly and i think miami wins somehow they sneak around a chicken coop and win it i think it's not about larry fitzgerald it's about brandon myrie running the football and also brock berlin and the miami offense struggling on the road and i think that pitt's gonna win this game i like pitt 
Well, this is it for us. This is our final road show of the season here. I want to thank the great stage crew here. These guys are phenomenal. Many of these guys have been with us for years and years. You guys do a great job. Thank you. Thank the guys in the truck. And now for the pick of the 100th College Game Day Road Show. Will it be the Knowles or the Gators? Kirk, I'll start. I start. think I think that Florida State comes in, especially with the defense, with their backs against the wall, the way they have played. They realize that what they can do, they can they can salvage the last couple of weeks by beating Florida. On the other hand, you have Chris Leak and a Florida team that's gotten better and better. They've been able to win five straight after starting the year three and three. And I I think they put the exclamation point with a victory today over Florida State at home. Ron Sook, heck of a job turning this thing around. Nice I like pick. Florida. I like. I love Florida State. <laughs> Uh oh Is it reverse psychology motivation? He's going Albert and the Gators while doing the tomahawk chop. Interesting. Once again, you say Arizona will call a press conference. Mike Stoops yeah, headed to Arizona. Mike Stoops, congratulations. The next head coach for the University of Arizona. Congratulations. Bowling Green and Toledo coming up next. Enjoy. We'll see you next week. All right, Toledo and Bowling Green, a series. Well priced gifts for the holiday season. To Kentucky game to join CBS's coverage of Florida State versus Florida. Well, he needs his field goal that gets away from a field goal tie in the game. National glory superseded even state bragging rights. Harrison to the 20. They're not going to catch him. Touchdown, Gators. It is caught by Don. He's got the first down to the 40. Down to the 50. Touchdown, Florida State. He's got Hilliard. He splits free. At the 10. The 5. He's in. By Green at the 40, cutting left side. Crazy Green. Oh, my. Warwick to the 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, FSU. Florida State, Florida. Bitter interstate rivals. Each at a crossroads, searching for the victory that will return them to national prominence and validate their respective seasons. Again this afternoon, we welcome you to the Home Depot SEC on CBS. A full house, more than 90,000 gathered at Ben Hill Griffin Stadium in Gainesville, Florida, as the Seminoles come across state from Tallahassee to take on the Gators. It is senior day in Gainesville. And among those who received the most wildly appreciated applause, Ben Troop and Kiwan Ratliff. The Seminoles from Tallahassee and the Gators from Florida. And here come the Gators. They come in having won.
won five in a row. And still with a chance to get to Atlanta for the SEC championship game. And taking a leisurely stroll on the Florida field, the seven holes of FSU. Well, take the quiet approach when you can. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vern Lundquist, along with Todd Blackledge and Jill Arrington. We welcome you to Gainesville. Florida State knows what is in their near future. They have won the ACC. They will be in the BS BCS Bowl game for the fifth time in six years. A little murkier picture for Florida. It depends on what's going on elsewhere today. Georgia currently leads Georgia Tech. Looks like they will win. Tennessee has a six-point lead over Kentucky. If you're a Gator fan, best thing that could happen is for Kentucky to defeat Tennessee if that happens. And here comes the late arriving crowd from Tallahassee, the seven holes of Florida State. So the Florida Gators will wait now to see and hope that Kentucky can win. If there is a three-way tie, it gets a little cloudier. We'll develop that as the afternoon goes on. Let's talk about this game. Remember that irritating kid in the neighborhood from your youth? He was the guy that you didn't like how he dressed. You didn't like how he spoke. You didn't like his swagger or the way he combed his hair. And he felt the same way about you. Well, think Florida and Florida State. Todd Blackledge, what is at stake in this game? Well, it's so important for both teams. I mean, Florida State State, they want to prove that they are back among college football's elite, and a win today would be their first against a ranked opponent this year and give them their first 10-win season since 2000. Florida, they've had a great turnaround after starting 3-3. Three and three. Five games in a row they've won. A win today would put an exclamation point on that turnaround and it would give Ron Zook his first win against either one of his in-state rivals and give him some momentum going into the recruiting battle. Well, these are two very closely uh, talented teams. What are keys? I think the first key is the running game. Both teams want to run the football, and the one telling stat in the last 15 games between these two teams, whoever's run for the most yards has won 13 of them. The other key is going to be the quarterback play. Who will protect the ball? Who will make good decisions? Now, Chris Ricks of Florida State has had kind of an up-and-down career, but in this game last year against these Gators, he single-handedly took over the football game. He threw two touchdown passes to Anquan Bolden, but it was his running ability that set the game apart. 80 three yards rushing out of the pocket kept a lot of drives alive so his running ability very important for this Gator defense to contend with now Chris Lee the true freshman for Florida a guy who keeps getting better and better each week his numbers are not all that impressive except the bottom one six and one as a starter he's improving every week he played well against some good defenses early he's got to play well against Florida State today well, a cold front uh, moved through here yesterday afternoon. It is chilly by Florida standards. I don't think the folks in Buffalo will have any uh, sympathy for anybody down here. 52 degrees and a slight breeze out of the north. Well, Tallahassee up in the panhandle. They have made the trip over. These two teams did not begin this series until 1958. Florida leads in games played in Gainesville last year. It was a convincing FSU win. As a matter of fact, the Seminoles have won four of the last five meetings between these two. Florida won the toss. They have opted to defer the option to the second half. So the Seminoles of Florida State will receive the opening kickoff as we get underway. Final regular season game between these two teams. Chris Ricks on the sidelines. And a recently expanded Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. Up in the 92,000 range now. Kelvin Kite. Matt Petrovich will kick off. He is the kickoff specialist this team. And if you've uh, followed the Gators over the years, you know of Petrovich's inclination to get in and mix it up on kickoffs. He's a high school linebacker. Did you see the opening kickoff to Florida State weren't sure if we were going to see Antonio Cromartie. He had a knee injury in the North Carolina State game two weeks ago. He's been a big spark for them on the kickoff returns, along with Leon Washington. But it looks like Cromartie good to go here today. And we have a uh, full crew of ACC officials working this game. Here's Petrovich. We're underway. <laughs> he went right after Petrovich. <laughs> Taken by Cromartie at the five. He's got some speed. 
There's a fumble. The ball might be ruled down by contact. Corey Bailey came up with it, but I think it will retain FSU. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the Gators came off celebrating like they had the football, and they did come out of the pile with the ball. But he was ruled down before the ball came loose. Cromarty, the ball is out, Whoa. and his left knee is down. Now, was the knee down before the ball came out? That's the question. His left knee did hit the ground. Boy, that's so hard to tell. It's hard to tell. Boy, that is snap, snap. In the National Football League, we'd now be spending five minutes <laughs> looking right. at it. All right. Well, first down and ten. Chris Ricks backs in the eye. Play fake. Ricks comes out to his left. Pulls up. Looks deep. Nobody there. Has to scramble, which he does well. But not this time. Marcus Thomas, number 44, in in the starting lineup with the tackle. That's... Uh, Talk about Chris Ricks, enigmatic might be a good term. He's yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, I mean, he makes great plays and he makes really bad mistakes. You know, there's not a lot of gray area with him. And the way that Bobby Bowden says it, you know, the good thing for us is he has more goods than he has bads. You know, he, he makes more good plays than he does bad plays. No gain on the last play, so they'll go from the eye again. Dominic Robinson is up top of the screen. He replaces the injured Cafonso Thorpe. Double tight end set. They hand it off to Greg Jones. Power run. And he picks up four yards over the left guard spot. Runs into Bobby McCray. Now let's check the uh, Earthlink starting lineup for Florida State. The offensive line. The All-American, Alex Barron. Meinrod, Castillo, Meeks, and Willis. Grafonso fourth. Broken leg. Last game two weeks ago. Greg Jones and Coleman in the backfield. P.K. Sam. Robinson gets the start at the wideout. And Paul Irons is the tight end. And right away we see a situation of which receiver is going to step up to fill the gap left by Crafonzo Thorpe, the go-to guy in this offense. Well played. Jones gets a block, and he is tackled short of the first down at the 39-yard line. Kenny Parker, number 58, a junior, was the man who got there first. Kind of a conservative play call on third down by Florida State with good field position, but... Florida had their nickel defense in, and Florida State thought they could spring a run through there, but good run defense that time by the Gators. Fourth and two. Keewon Ratliff is back. He awaits the punt of Jesse Stein, the senior. Here is the snap. The turn is on all the way. It's not an effective punt. It does take a Florida State bounce and hits one of the down men right in the keister. 35-yard punt, nothing on the return. And there's a flag back at the 41-yard line. Oh, boy. Uh, is this... Mike, quite obviously. And Ron Zook gets a chance to register his displeasure. It will come back and it will be. It'll be first down for Florida first State. Down Florida defensive State. holding on the punt return team by the Gators. And so it's a it's an automatic first down for Florida State. And now the ball at the 50-yard line. So a big turnaround play after the stop on third down. A penalty on the special teams gives Florida State the ball right back. Now we had a phantom fumble, and now we've got defensive yeah. holding. That's Things right. have gone the way of FSU early on. First down and 10. Might be a shot where Ricks takes a shot deep. There's the toss, and Leon Washington is in. The second of the three uh, tailbacks. What a run. Power run. And let's check in the uh, Florida defensive unit now. They have been susceptible throughout the season to a running game. Daryl Lee, Kenny Parker, McDonald, and Travis Harris up front. Matt Ferrier, Reed Fleming, and Channing Crowder. He's a sensational freshman linebacker. And uh, an all-senior quartet in the secondary. Lamar, Dixon, Gus Scott, and the All-American, Kiwan Ratliff, so named 
by the football writers this week. 11 yard gain, first and 10. Opening drive of the ball game. Movement, tight end. Paul Irons took off a little bit early. And we'll see if the mic is working this time. The answer is no. Let's go down to Jill Arrington. Well, Vern, as you said, it, it's senior day here in the swamp, and it's sure to be an emotional send-off for Florida's 22 seniors. Not only is this their last home game here, but it's also against their biggest rival, Florida State, Florida. Now, Kewan Ratliff told me these seniors have taken ownership of this team. He says this is our biggest game. We are calling this our championship game, and we want to win it. All right, Jill, thank you. First and 15. And again, Chris Ricks, this time with the audible. Coleman, the fullback, and Washington is the deep back. Quick setup. Ricks nail from behind. Marcus Thomas, who has really come on yeah. in the last three or four games. Well, Chris Ricks audibled because he saw the blitz and he knew he was going to have man to man. But what he didn't do is he didn't get rid of the ball quick. When you do a three-step drop and audible, you better get rid of that ball fast. And Marcus Thomas in there for the sack on the short drop by the quarterback, Chris Ricks. That's a loss of five. The first full sack for the true freshman out of Jacksonville, Marcus Thomas. He's one of 14 mm -hmm. true freshmen who have participated for Florida this year. Second down and 20. Reverse. And the handoff coming left side. Wow, good defense. Chris Davis. Ball is down. Yeah, he was down, but that was an outstanding play by Bobby McCray. The defensive end, you tell him on a reverse, you've got to play your position. Stay at home. Watch Bobby McCray not get sucked in by the fake, but stay at home and then use that acceleration to make the play on the reverse. Gus Scott also there, but if Bobby McCray doesn't stay at home and respect that backside, that's a big play for Florida State. That will go as a tackle for loss. It'll be 11 and a half on the season for Bobby McRae, who erupted in the big Florida win at LSU when he had three sacks. The only loss on the LSU ledger this year. Third down and 25. Rick's back with time. Deep. Double coverage. Way down there. Intended for P.K. Sam incomplete. The first third down play. Florida State was in a regular eye formation and ran the ball. That time, straight eye formation, it was only a two-man route. So a lot of double coverage opportunities for the Florida defense and a nice hold after the penalty by the Gator defense. And another fourth down, the last negated by the holding call. So here again is Jesse Stein, and Kewan Ratliff awaits it uh, at the 12-yard line. Ratliff, who has nine interceptions this year. And a low kick. Yes, it is. And he's uh, nailed good downfield coverage at the 24-yard line. That's a 34-yard punt, five on the return. Gators have the ball in offense for the first time. We are at Ben Hill Griffin Stadium in Gainesville. Oh boy. Oh boy. This isn't gonna do it. These uh these burritos are a bit smaller than we expected. We're hungry. Maybe ten? Yeah, ten yeah, more. Ten We're, more. We'll make it like an even dozen. That uh, that'll probably do us. Alright, this should do it. That's good. Uh, did you order some? Uh Big Breakfast Burritos. Sonic's got them, others don't. Breakfast at Sonic featuring really big burritos stuffed with sausage, egg, and cheese. It's not just good, it's Sonic good. Sprint's got wireless and wireline integrated, managed as one seamless network. Yeah, but we're meeting with AT&T. And AT&T Wireless. Huh? Hi. Hello. How you doing? Hi. <laughs> How are you? How are you? AT&T. AT&T Wireless. So when do we meet with Sprint? Two guys, one suit. You should have seen it. 
Sometimes seeing is believing. Get integrated wireline and wireless services from one company. Get the facts at Sprint.com. One Sprint, many solutions. Kirk Browning, Oksana Bayul, and Brian Boitano burn up the ice. Plus, the gold medal rematch the world's been waiting for. Olay presents Ice Wars 10, all new CBS tonight. NFL doubleheader tomorrow on CBS. The early game led by New England at Indianapolis. Greg Gumbel, Phil Sims will be there for that one. And the late game, the lead game is Kansas City at San Diego. Dick Enberg, Dan Deerdorf will be out there. And uh, the quartet that occupies that space so in front of the Plaza Hotel in New York will be along tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern time. First down for Chris Leak and the Florida Gators. And they have a first down at the 24-yard line. Leak, the 18-year-old freshman in his eighth start. He's 6-1 and one as a starter. Flips it out left side. Flag is down on the near side, thrown at the line of scrimmage. The pass is complete to Carlos Perez if it stands. We mentioned how both these teams will play three different running backs, and they'll have different kinds of rotation. They're going to try to find who has the hot hand. Seattle facing this, the starter now for Florida, and over this five-game winning streak, he has certainly had the hottest hand for the Gators, averaging just about 90 yards per game rushing in this win streak. Faison had 190 yards last week, or two weeks ago, actually in their most recent victory. And uh, Ed Zonbrecker, the offensive coordinator, quarterback coach, I think is doing a great job with giving him a little bit more each week. And his advice today, throw it fast, because this <laughs> front four can rush the quarterback. <laughs> Florida loads up with three to the left side, one wide right. And it is a uh, run blitz for the Seminoles. Seattle facing caught and dropped and may have lost a half a yard. Let's check this uh, offense now for the Gators of Florida. Offensive line, Starks and Snell, seniors, and the other three are sophomores, DeGory, Butler, and Randy Haynes. Rand Carthen, a fifth-year senior, O.J. Small, Perez, Kelvin Kite, and Ben Troop. Well, they talk a lot about the youth of this team, but there are 15 seniors who start on both sides of the ball. This one flipped out to Andre Caldwell, number five, and he is... Uh, close to the first down. Now the FSU defense, very good front seven. Darnell Dockett making uh, his 48th start today, Womble, Moore, and Emmanuel. The linebackers, Bullware, Augustine, and Kendall Pope. And in the secondary, Rufus Brown gets a start today. B.J. Ward, Jerome Carter, and Sanford, Stanford Samuels complete that list. First and ten, and here is a handoff and no game. See, the strength of this Florida State defense is their front four, and it's not just their starters. It's their backups that can also make plays as facing a little slow getting off the ground after that run. Jeff Womble, the senior in there on that play, but their, their front four uh, is an outstanding unit. And, and again, their backups can come in and make plays too, so they rotate a lot of guys in among that front four. And because they're so good up there, this is not a real heavy blitz team. They, they rely on that front four to get pressure on the quarterback. Now, Seattle Faison trotted off and uh, is jogging around the sideline. Uh, the trainer trying to catch up with him. Here's a quick flip out to the near side. Perez gets a stinging block from O.J. Small. And that frees him out to the 43-yard line. And that is part of the Florida strategy is to throw those quick screens. It does a couple things. Number one, it gets the ball out of Chris Leak's hands fast. Number two, it makes this defense run all over the field. Last year, they threw eight screens against the Florida State defense. That's the second one already in the ballgame today. Rand Carthen is the running back now in third and one. He gets the handoff in a big hole. And he knocks down one of the safeties. B.J. Ward got jolted. Oh, boy. So you say you want to play free safety. Watch number 24 get a little bit too high trying to make this tackle. <laughs> Rand Carthen is zeroing in on him and puts that helmet right under the chin and runs through it. First down across the 50 of a 45-yard line, first and 10. High formation, here's the draw play. Carthen gets a block from Latsko, the fullback. Than you would if you were huddling up every play. Now O.J. Small lines up tight to the right. He's a wide receiver. And here's Lee, back, goes left side. 
Little pass underneath. It's complete to Carthen, and that's inside the 35. Actually, Carlos Perez, it's 23 instead of 33. So Carlos Perez, the senior wide receiver from Hoboken, New Jersey, who learned to speak English when he came from the Dominican Republic by watching Sesame Street. Yeah. Heads to the sidelines. It's a popular show in the Blackledge house, too. Sesame Street's good, <laughs> man. The four boys all still watch yeah. it, huh? Yeah. Mom and Pop, too? Yeah, you can't help it. It's all in the kitchen. Yeah. Breakfast. First down and 10 near the midway point of the opening quarter. This is the first Florida possession. That is behind Dallas Baker. Now, Chris Leak and uh, his communication with Ed Zonbrecher is something to watch with great interest. Yeah, I mean, what they do is, again, they don't huddle. So Ed's signaling in the play to him, and Chris Leak is going to call it. And then they may even change it once they see how the defense sets up. So Chris has got the play. And they're going with it. Now he looks at the sideline again. Now they've just audible. They're just changing the play now, but it came from Zonbrecher after he saw how the defense was set up. So it's great communication between those two guys on the field. Ninth play of the drive. Carthen gets the handoff, comes to the right side, has Max Starks, one of the senior tackles out in front of him, big Max Starks, heavy-footed Max Starks with his <laughs> size 19 shoe. Take a look at what Chris Leak has done and where he's gone with the football in this five-game win streak. 20 to the running backs, 14 to his tight end, Ben Troop. You see 43 to the wide receiver, but a lot of those are screen passes, okay? At least half of those, or a third of them, have been screen passes, quick throws to those wide receivers. Third and seven. Small is the man in motion. Here comes the corner blitz. Leak reads it, goes for Kelvin Kite. Too strong, out of bounds, incomplete. It'll be fourth down, and we're going to see Matt Leach, who hit a career-long field goal of 50 yards in that win at LSU back in October. Matt Leach, 6'1", junior from Sarasota, Florida, for the season, as you can see, 16 of 21. This will be from 47 yards away. Sean Morton, the senior, will hold it, and Casey Griffith, another senior, will snap it back. Got it. 47 away. Opening thrust is successful for the Gators of Florida as Matt Leach knocks it true from 47. And the Gators take a 3 nothing lead. great tasting beer because you can get in line and take what they give you or you can make your own choice miller good call here's the petrovich kick flag is down fumble loose ball yeah, loose. they picked it up the only let's go got it but it might come yeah. back the only problem is where that flag is laying it looks like florida may have been offsides on the kickoff team That's why you don't see celebrating on the Florida sideline. Billy Latsko, number 42. Boy, picked it up. Two huge penalties in the special teams right away for Ron Zook's squad. The Man. first one gave him that first down on the fourth down punt play, and this one may cost him a touchdown. Illegal procedure is the call. We joined uh, the referee late in that, so didn't hear the first part of the explanation. 
So it wipes out a touchdown for Florida on the fumble kickoff return. And Ron Zook is a specialist in special teams. Yeah. He spent the first part of his career at Florida in the early 90s as the special teams coach. And there's a little preaching going on in that yeah. group right now. And their special teams have been very solid this year. Last year in his first year as a head coach, they had some problems. This year, they've been pretty solid on special teams. And in a game like this, with so many good skill players, a play or two in the special teams, a break here or there in the kicking game can make a big difference. They just gave one back right there. And now Willie Reed has uh, taken one of the two spots deep to return it. It's Cromarty and Reed. Leon Washington is not. Is there. This will be Willie Reed. At the 22 yard line. And now for the high Pontiac high performance update. Let's go back to New York and Tim Brando. Vernon Todd, 7.34 went off the clock. Cedric Houston with a punishing touchdown run with 23 seconds left. Tennessee appears to be on their way to victory. Georgia in that other key game up 27 to 10. Now remember, with Tennessee's win, LSU now needs Florida to win impressively and a Miami loss tonight because that would weaken Tennessee's BCS standing because they beat Miami. All right, thank you, Tim. 3-0 now, first and 10, ball at the 22-yard line. Chris Ricks, backs in the eye. Lorenzo Booker is on for the first time, number 28 at tailback. He gets the handoff, comes to his left, and then back up the middle of the field at the 28-yard line. We talked about both teams with three tailbacks and wanting to find ways to rotate them. Well, the way Florida State rotates is they go by series. So the first series, the senior Greg Jones was out there. The second series was Leon Washington. And now it's Lorenzo Booker's time to come on and play. The third offensive series for Florida State. Gain of seven for Booker, second down and three. Sweep with James Coleman in front. He gets a terrific block on Johnny Lamar. Well, they really sealed the corner, too. Alex Barron, the All-American tackle, doing a great job on the edge there. Booker had a lot of green grass and white jerseys out there. Not many blue shirts on the corner. That's a gain of nine and a first down for the season. 286 yards, an outstanding average of 6.4. Booker, the freshman from Ventura, California. First down and 10. Booker again. Movement on that right side of the offensive line, pushing the pile to the north. And uh, he's across the 40 and out to the 42-yard line. You mentioned some of the problems that Florida has had stopping the run this year. Eighth in the SEC coming into today, giving up 154 yards per game. And a couple teams really hurt them. And they lost to Ole Miss here back before the win streak started. Ole Miss ran the ball 36 times for 223 yards against Charlie Strong's defense. So what you'll see Florida do is commit extra people. One of those safeties, Dixon or Gus Scott, will sneak up to the line of scrimmage right before the ball snap to try to get an extra safety in ball. Cross right side again. They keep it on the ground. The other part of that equation is that this uh, Florida State team in their win, a thrilling win in double overtime against North Carolina State two weeks ago, rushed for 272 yards. So this... Uh, Tri-headed tailback uh, is very effective for them. And they've got Greg Jones, the big one. The other two backs, Booker and Washington, a little smaller but much more elusive. Yeah. yeah Greg Jones is kind of the hammer. I mean, he's the guy that's going to run more physical between the tackles. Probably you would expect to see him as a, a third down back. But again, they rotate by series. So Booker's still in there on this third and short. Third and one. Ricks, handoff. Booker first down as he uh, crosses the 50 into the arms of Marcus Thomas, number 44. 
And what this kind of offensive attack does for Florida State also, it takes a little steam out of the Florida defense, and it sets up what they love to do, which is go play action and fake to the tailback and let Chris Ricks throw the ball deep down the field. I mean, he will throw a bunch of deep balls during the course of the game. Only problem for him, his favorite target, Grafonzo Thorpe, not in the ball game because of the broken leg. Sixth play of the drive. The previous five have been on the ground. Here's the first pass of this drive. Ricks looking deep in the middle, has a man open. And there is a catch and a fumble. Yep, that's going to be called a fumble. Oh, now they're waving it off incomplete. Oh, boy, this crowd's going to go crazy. And there's a flag down late. And the referees, uh, this ACC crew, better get things in check here. has been a, a touchdown on a fumble recovery negated by offsides ruled against Florida and now we have a dead ball personal by the defense that's a 15 yard penalty and an automatic first down well I think Mo Mitchell is the guy that got the personal foul Gus Scott is going to be the guy that's going to knock the ball loose was it a catch that's a catch. That should have been a fumble caused by Gus Scott. A good hit. The ball is caught. The foot is down. That should have been a fumble. But there was a personal foul, I believe, on Mo Mitchell after the play and Florida State on the 35-yard line. Trailing by three. Mo Mitchell, a part of a controversial play last year. Here's uh, the player stop. Oh, they're going to rule this one down by contact. You know what? <laughs> This is the team that leads the SEC in takeaways with 30. And they believe that they can make turnovers every game they play. They'll strip the ball out. We've seen the ball come loose three times now. Sooner or later, they're going to get that call. Ball is down at the 35, no game. And that reaction is to the uh, Jumbotron screen replaying the last play in which Booker was ruled. And see, I, I could see how they could have called that forward that his progress. momentum was stopped. Right. Forward progress. Channing Crowder had him stood up, and they ripped the ball out late. Greg Jones in the tailback now on second down. Play fake. Ricks deep in the middle. Got a man wide open. Caught. Touchdown. FSU. Dominic Robinson, number 21. First touchdown catch of the season for the man who starts today in place of Carpazzo Thorpe. And you see the arm strength of Chris Ricks as well. He had great protection, so he was able to stay in the pocket. It's only a two-man route. Kiwan Ratliff took a peek back at the quarterback. Gus Scott late getting over to help as the safety. And a throw right to the back of the end zone by Chris Ricks. Extra point from Batia is up and good. And part of that is the Florida defense frustrated that they weren't getting the calls, maybe lost their concentration, and Chris Ricks made them pay for it. When your picture really matters, rely on Verizon Wireless. Opening quarter, 7-3 Florida State. After the 35-yard touchdown pass, Chris Ricks to Dominic Robinson. Andre Caldwell ready to uh, return the kick of Zabied Betia. Florida State, eight plays, 78 yards, and a couple of controversial moments during that drive. Here's Robinson getting some uh, words of congratulation and some advice at the same time. And here is Caldwell at the four. Andre Caldwell gets a couple of blocks, skips across the 25, and is down at the 28. Well, crowd was in an uproar, and uh, here is why. First, the kickoff from Petrovich. There was a fumble return for the uh, touchdown by Billy Latsko. After Cromarty fumbled, and it was ruled offside. And then this catch ruled incomplete. There was a fumble, but that was negated by the Mo Mitchell penalty. 
And then uh, probably the least controversial of the three was this play. Yeah, I think this was the right call. I do think the hit by Gus Scott was a legitimate fumble. And, and don't forget, the opening kickoff could have been called a fumble as well. They ruled him down before the ball came out. Here's a reverse for Florida. This is Calvin Kite, number two. Fights to the 35-yard line. Out of bounds at that spot. Now let's go back to New York for this high-performance high, high update. Easy for you to say, Vern. After a fake field goal, watch Wally Lundy set sail. His fourth touchdown of the day, this 19-yard run. And the game just went final. Virginia has beaten Virginia Tech. Wasn't that long ago we were talking about the Hokies and a national title, was it? Uh, no, and I'll try and get it right next time, Tim. I promise. Second down and three. And they fake the quick screen, the handoff. And Eric Moore was not deceived at all. Yeah, we talked about the defensive end, Bobby McRae, staying at home on the reverse for Florida. Well, this is Eric Moore staying at home on the draw play and not getting suckered into that play because you don't block him. So you're hoping that he's going to go with the fake and run out to defend the screen. But he stayed right there and made the play. Third and four. Final minute, opening quarter, 7-3 FSU. Florida State, the best third down defense in the ACC, only allowing 28% conversions. We've got nine men up now, two deep. Not backing out. And they send only four. Here's Lee going deep for his tight end. He's got troop. And here's the amazing thing about this play. Ben Troop is going to beat most safeties and most linebackers. But Ben Troop didn't beat a safety or linebacker. He beat the best cover corner, Stanford Samuels. Number 10, Stanford Samuels, is going to be the guy that's trailing Ben Troop. That's the best cornerback on the Florida State team. They put him on Ben Troop thinking they might go there with the football, and he still got beat by the outstanding senior tight end. Mm. 31-yard gain on the 36th catch of the season for... Ben Troop, a finalist for the John Mackey Award, announced this week. And uh, on the first down play, they give it off to Seatrick Faison, who's back in the lineup. Ben Troop out of Augusta, Georgia. It's just amazing. I mean, that's his 36th catch on the season. Before this year, coming into the season, only 25 catches in his whole career combined. And he's having a banner year and well-deserving to be a finalist for the Mackey Award. Second down and eight now as we near the end of the uh, first quarter of play. Matter of fact, we've not only neared it, <laughs> we've reached it. That's the end of one, seven to three. We'll return to Ben Hill Griffin Stadium after this message and a word from your local station. For the game, Kiwan Ratliff from Columbus, Ohio. 90,000 in a brisk wind this afternoon, a sunsplash day, but a little chilly by Florida standards. We began the second quarter. Vern Lundquist, Todd Blackledge, Jill Arrington, 7-3 to three in Chris Leak. And the Gators have a second down and eight at the FSU 38-yard line. Here's the pass left side. It is incomplete. 7-3 game. We talked at the outset, Todd, about uh, the importance of the quarterbacks in this game. They've both proven effective so far. Well, they've kept their poise, and, and it was a crazy first quarter. You know, turnovers that weren't turnovers, penalties, a lot of high energy, high emotion, but both quarterbacks kept their poise. Chris Ricks only completed one pass, but it was a beauty, a 35-yard touchdown throw, and that for uh, Chris Leak now, four of seven. So he's kept his poise against this Florida State defense as his team moving the football in scoring territory again. Third and eight, O.J. Small is in motion wide to the right. Three-man rush for FSU. Leak will dance out of there, but uh, is nearly decapitated as he gets to the 30-yard line. There's a football is ruled down. Now let's go back to New York for a Pontiac high-performance update. Here's Tim. All right, Vern. Well, good news for LSU. David Green, 11-yard touchdown pass to Craig Lumpkin. The route is on against Georgia Tech by Georgia, but just over four minutes left in the game. Now the Tigers need Florida to take care of business against Florida State. Who would you guys pick in the SEC East? SEC East, uh, Georgia. You see the final on Tennessee, so they've done their part to, uh, to stay in the hunt. Here's the field goal attempt from Leach. Wide left. 
from 48 yards away. So Matt Leach is one of two now. And the ball goes over on down. I'm not sure that Matt Leach was affected by this, but Florida State has a guy right there, number 24, B.J. Ward, who can jump like crazy. I mean, he's got seven field goal blocks in his career. He has a 42-inch vertical leap, and uh, on both of those field goal attempts, he's right in the middle, coming right up into the eyesight of the kicker. It's got to be somewhat of a distraction. He's got one against Notre Dame this year. Also has blocked a couple of punts, a 42 and a half inch vertical leap. What did we decide last year? David Thompson, the old basketball, not old basketball player, the basketball player who right. played a few years ago at North Carolina State. Uh, they measured his at 48 <laughs> inches. And, and yourself? Yeah, about 28, My, maybe, on a good day. Yeah, but you start at 6'4". <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, the SEC standings, all three, six and two. Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida. And uh, the SEC issued a statement earlier today regarding these standings, although the official BCS rankings will not be released until 6 o'clock on Monday, December 1st. Mike Trangese, the Bowl Championship Series coordinator, will inform the SEC late Sunday afternoon of the rankings. The SEC can then determine who will represent the SEC East in the championship game. First down and 10. Well, after this play, I'll tell you why that's so important to get it done then instead of waiting till Monday. Here's Ricks and our Greg Jones. And he is out to the 39-yard line. Go ahead. See, after Saturday games, Sunday is the, the big day for preparation for coaching staff. So Nick Saban and his staff, I mean, they know they're in. And they want to get busy working. If you had to wait till 6 p.m. on Saturday to find out who you were going to play, that's basically two wasted days in terms of getting ready Monday. for the championship game. Right. Monday. Yeah, Monday. Second down and three. Florida State has gone to the air only four times, three times thus far. Sweep right side with Greg Jones, and he's going to be brought down close to the first down. Sunday on CBS, a night of great holiday entertainment. 20 years ago, he became a hero that disappeared. Now, a mysterious stranger just might, his, might make his family's wish of finding him come true. Peter Falk, Valerie Bertinelli star in a world premiere holiday movie, Finding John Christmas, Sunday at 9, 8 Central on CBS. Florida State, uh, their game plan is very clear right now. That's the 13th run in the ball game for them. You mentioned only three pass attempts for Chris Ricks. So they want to run the football and challenge this Florida defense that has had some problems with people running the football on them. Georgia ran for over 200 yards against the Gators. South Carolina two weeks ago, 199 yards rushing. And this is this is a different kind of offense. You know, you, when you think of Florida State, you think of Chris Winkie, and you think of Charlie Ward, you think of that fast break type offense. But they still have that capability, but they are just as comfortable lining up with a tight end or two tight ends and running that football and throwing the ball off play action with maximum pass protection. And that's that's kind of the mode they're in right now. And they enjoy a 7-3 lead, first and 10 after the measurement. Chauncey Stovall is in the field now. He and Robinson are the wideouts. Stovall, top of the screen, number 15. Florida showing a blitz look. They are coming. That's Reed Fleming. And Greg Jones breaks a tackle. Boy, dropped the ball, though. The ball is on the ground at the end of the play. They're ruling him down. But another loose football for Florida State. Just across the 50. Again, J Greg Jones is the hammer back. I mean, he's the guy that's not going to make many people miss. He broke one tackle by Reed Fleming, ran right over Daryl Dixon. And at the end, that, that was a fumble again. I mean, they ruled him down, but I think that ball came out before he hit the ground. And no reaction from the yeah. crowd. I'm not sure whether they... Uh, that's interesting. Either that or Florida State fell on. I didn't even see the end of it. Maybe they just recovered it. Second down and two. 
FSU on top, virtue of the 35-yard pass. Three wideouts in the field now. Here's a handoff again. And this is Leon Washington skipping out to the right side. Really a nice cut by Leon because Channing Crowder was quickly across the line of scrimmage with penetration, but Leon was able to make a quick cut outside of Channing Crowder and, and pick up nice yardage. End of that previous play. Let's see if it was a fumble. And here's Greg Jones, and at the end of the play, again, they stripped the ball out. The ball came out, and who fell on it? Maybe Florida State fell on the football. Dominic Robinson, number 21, covered up the mistake of his buddy. First down and 10 at the 44, 7 to 3. Second quarter. Here's the toss. Washington has Coleman in front, cuts inside of his block. Look how elusive he is. Well, you wait each week, don't you, for this time? And it is time now for the Aplac trivia question of the afternoon. Why did Florida State and Florida not play each other until 1958? So many of these series between bitter rivals go back 80, 90, 100 years. This from 46 years ago. First down and 10. A lot of people in Florida are saying, oh, that's too easy. <laughs> But I'll bet folks around the country don't know. Yeah. First down and 10. High formation, toss, sweep, right side. And Washington inside the 30 to the 28-yard line. Leon Washington, you saw the note that he had 134 yards in this game a year ago. And he came on to replace Greg Jones, who went out with knee surgery only four days. And here's the toss. Again, a just nice job by that front of Florida State, kind of controlling things up there. The big guys up there not allowing penetration by the Florida defense. And the problem for Florida right now is they are committing enough guys to outnumber Florida State in the running game, but they're not able to stop it. And that, that doesn't bode well for the Gators. Seventh play of the drive, previous six. It all been runs. Here's the flip left side. There's the catch inside by Chris Davis, number wow. five, the freshman. And another first down at the 21-yard line. Boy, is he quick, too. I mean, he, he's a freshman, only 173 pounds, but watch how quick he is. He's going to fake Kiwan Ratliff, a pretty good football player, right out. Boom, left foot in the ground, cuts back to the inside. Mm. First and 10 at the 20-yard line. 7-3. Ten minutes to go in the half. Davis wide to the left. P.K. Sam, number four, bottom of the screen. On the ground, Washington. Nothing doing this time. Stephen Harris, number 93, was there to make the tackle. Now, Crefonzo Thorpe, that uh, very, very hard break. Both bones in his leg broken last week. P.K. Sam Davis and Dominic Robinson today. Two receptions between them. Robinson had the big one for a touchdown. The other thing about missing Crefonzo Thorpe is he had 11 of the team's 22 touchdown receptions. So, I mean, he was the big play guy. Not only the big yardage guy, but the scoring play guy, too. Second and ten. Carrier slip. Washington is on. Kenny Parker, number 58, with a tackle. Uh, Crefonzo Thorpe, just six yards shy of a thousand for the season. A Boletnikoff Award semifinalist, uh, broken leg, late in the ball game in the win against. Yeah, the next State. to the last play. I mean, there, there was the running play on first down that gained 12 or 13 yards, and he got hurt. And they covered him off the field in the next play. Leon Washington ran 12 yards for the touchdown. The game was over. Third and 11. Ricks keeps it on the ground. Nice move, Washington. Short, however, of the first down. And we should see Bethia, the field goal kicker, on the field. Well, Florida thinking pass all the way on third and 11. Look how big those spaces are in between those linemen. A lot of big gaps in there. Just a normal running play out of the I formation, and Washington almost picks up the first down. 
But those linemen, the defensive linemen from Florida with wide splits trying to get up the field in the pass rush, almost gave up the first down. Right here is Xavier Betia, 18 of 23, long for the season, 48. He had a 32-yarder blocked in that game against NC State. Fourth and one, this from 28 yards out. Cuts it inside the right upright, and that extends the FSU lead to seven points. We play in Gainesville, 10 to 3, FSU. On the left side, that's a brand new press box complete with skyboxes. Opened this summer after two years of construction and uh, added some seats and not just a small amount of revenue. Okay. To the coffers at the University of Florida. Added some nice space to our digs, it too. I mean, did. We're, we've stepped up here now, I'm going to tell you. Well, I miss broadcasting right next to Nat Moore <laughs> for the Sunshine Network. That's right, up in that blue box. Uh, timeouts, we just reach out and give high fives to each other. <laughs> Xavier Bethia will kick off for Florida State. After the field goal, they lead 10-3. And here is Andre Caldwell moving up and grabbing it just short of the 10. Now he comes left. Can he get around the corner with a stiff arm? Yes, but there's pursuit that takes him down. And a flag goes down with him. Yeah. It was still a good return by Caldwell turning the corner and getting it out past the 30. And they might get 15 more tacked on at the end of the play now. I think this is a very important offensive series for Florida. Obviously, to, to stay close in the game, they're only down seven, but even more than that, to let their defense rest a little bit. Injured Seminole down. The defense has been on the field a long time against this Florida State running game. Looks like that's Bryant McFadden, the cornerback, the junior from Hollywood, Florida. Here's Caldwell on the return. He is out of bounds at the 34-yard line, a flag was thrown as he went out of bounds, and we'll take a timeout. Look at this play, 10 to 3. Casey Anderson is going to be the guy that's going to get called for the penalty for a late hit, but he's actually blocked in the back into the pile. And they called a personal foul on Florida State. I'm not so sure that should have been a personal foul on the kid from Florida State. On first down from the 49, Leak finds Kelvin Kite, Kelvin Kite out to the right side. And he is at the 40-yard line. Well, final score, Georgia 34-17. And so the standings now, there's a three-way tie. Georgia wins its 10th game. Tennessee wins its 10th game. Florida 8-3. and three. They're going after their sixth straight win. It's going to be up to the DCS difference. And right now, the only way that... Georgia does not go to Atlanta to face LSU for a second time is if somehow Florida would be able to move past Tennessee in the BCS rankings and be within five of Georgia. If that were the case, then they would win the head-to-head -head with the Georgia Bulldogs because they beat them in Jacksonville. Here's Perez, left side. Now the three teams coming in, the BCS rank 7, 8, and 11. So they would have to jump over Tennessee, and then the yeah. comparison would be head-to-head uh, -head competition between the two teams with the highest ranking. You know, so many other games affect the BCS. The Miami-Pittsburgh game tonight has a lot of effect because if Pittsburgh would beat Miami, that would hurt Tennessee's quality win part of that formula. Here's Deshaun win on the carry on third down. Travis Johnson makes the tackle. It's going to be fourth. And they're going to bring Matt Leach on, fourth and one. And some rumblings in the crowd on this one. Matt Leach is one of two. He connected from 47. He missed from 48. And this will be from 47 again. And keep an eye on 24, B.J. Ward again. He'll be right in the middle of the screen. And so Matt Leach, and he's going to look right up at him as he kicks this football. Here's the snap, the hole, the kick is on the way, and this one looks perfect. Yep. Oh, got the good bounce. Ha. The junior gets a break on senior day. And that'll bring a smile. CBS Sports coverage of the Home Depot SEC.
on CBS continues after this word from your local station. Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. Florida State and Florida. It really heated up when Bobby Bowden came to FSU in 76. His first win against Florida was a 37 to 9 victory. A lot of folks go back to that 1991 game as a, among the most memorable. That was a Florida victory of 14 to 9. Here's Petrovic to kick off. Willie Reed and Leon Washington are the deep guys. There's Washington. Well, the first kickoff of the game, they went right after Petrovic. The last two, they've kind of let him run down the field. And they're, they're going to let him go this time. <laughs> but he's not running as fast as he did before. Washington brings it out from three deep. Look out. Look out again. Foot race. Leon Washington caught and out of bounds inside the 25. Chad Jackson, the wide receiver, caught up with him. 77 yard kickoff return. Boy, you, you know, you wonder was he smart to bring it out? Three yards deep in the end zone, but excellent vision and then the speed and the acceleration. Dallas Baker takes a bad angle, the wide receiver, but another freshman receiver, maybe the fastest of these young receivers, Chad Jackson, with a huge play to stop the touchdown. Leon Washington from nearby Jacksonville, his previous longest kickoff return this year, a rather modest 21 yards. First down and 10, FSU leads by, by four. And off right side, Booker tries to turn the corner. Channing Crowder bumps him out of bounds at the 20-yard line. Boy, you saw the speed of Channing Crowder there. And remember, this is a guy that had knee surgery the first week of October, middle of the season. And he is running sideline to sideline and forcing a very fast Lorenzo Booker out of bounds for a very short game. Man, that is great speed by a middle linebacker. Crowder, who is from Atlanta, committed to Georgia, then changed his mind. Not his mind. 90,407. That is a, a new attendance record at Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. And look at this. This is a, a one receiver set. Two tight ends, two backs, a power football set, and they're going to go play action. And they've got a man wide open. It's Henshaw, the tight end. Touchdown. First of the season for Matt Henshaw. Excellent job of play calling by Jeff Bowden. Bobby's son has been under fire a little bit as the offensive coordinator, but this was perfect. A perfect call, bringing a run formation. Here's Henshaw, the second string tight end, and he's gonna just beat his man. They try to hold him up on the line of scrimmage. That's Farrier, the linebacker that he beats. Excellent call, well executed by Chris Ricks. Bathia on for the extra point. Up and good. 20 yards, Matt Henshaw, first touchdown of the season. It's only the fourth catch he's made in 2003. Matt Henshaw gets the touchdown, whether it's the Sun Bowl, Holiday Bowl, or Cotton Bowl, to see how the bowl matchups are shaping up. Check out bowl projections by clicking on NCAA football at cbssportsline.com. 17-6, Florida State. Two plays, 23 yards, all set up on the 77-yard kickoff return by Leon Washington. Yeah, special teams, big plays in the special teams in a good ball game like this. And there's a bad play on the special teams for oh, Florida boy. State. That one's out of bounds. Take another look at that touchdown toss. Well, the reason this is such a good play, here's Henshaw, and he's going to run the corner out. But the reason it's so good is because the safety, Daryl Dixon, is going to favor this side because there's one, two receivers on that side of the formation. So watch as the play-action fake takes place. The safety favors the wide side of the field. Henshaw beats his man to the end zone, and Chris Ricks puts the ball in there perfectly for him. And that was an excellent play call out of a run formation throwing the football. Chris Ricks, two touchdowns today. 
And Matt Henshaw gets his first of the season. First down at the 35, Chris Leak. Play fake, backs up, pulls up. Now nailed. Can't hold the ball against this defense. Kendall Pope. I mean, once once Chris Leak stepped up, either throw it now or take off and run for whatever you can get. But this defense will not allow you to casually do that. It's a four-man rush. They expect pressure out of their front four, which they get. Now, right now, Chris Leak either has to throw it or tuck it and run. Kendall Pope, too fast to allow him to make anything happen. That is the first sack of the day. The 33rd of the season for this aggressive front four. Front seven, really, of uh, Florida State. There's the quick clip. Watch out, Jeff. They read that one. Rufus That's Brown with right. an excellent play. Again, the screens hurt Florida State last year. They ran eight of them. That's the fourth one that Florida's run today. They fake it one way, they come back the other way, and Rufus Brown slipped under the block of the tackle, Randy Hand. There was a guy out there to make the block, but Rufus Brown read the play too quickly to be blocked. Loss of five. Rufus Brown, mom Sheila, victim of three strokes in the last year, watching this game in her home. Third down, here's Leak. Deep right side, Kelvin Kite is there! Wow, and they got him! There. Oh, and Mickey Andrews is on the field, the defensive coordinator, and he is jawing at B.J. Ward, the free safety, because this is cover two. They show blitz, and then they're going to back out and play zone. So the corner's up, the safety's got to come over the top and make that play. You can't let that throw get made in there. Third down and really long. There's only certain places you can throw it against cover two, and Chris Leak stuck it in there. On first down, here's Faison. It was third and 21, and they got 24 for the first down. Let's go back to New York for a Pontiac High Performance Update. Once again, here's Tim. All right, congratulations. Virginia goes to the Gator against Maryland. Her? All right, Tim, thanks for helping us uh, keep it all straight back there. Second down and four. Here's Leak. Being chased, the second sack, yep. See, this defense maybe isn't as big and as physical as the LSU defense that he played earlier, but they might be faster. You know, in the Miami defense, even though Leak didn't start, he played some in that game, but that's a fast defense. When you step up in the pocket and get flushed out, you got to make a decision just like that. I mean, either throw the football or take, up, take off straight up the field. That is the second sack of Chris Leak. It's the seventh and a half this season for Eric Moore. Out of the shotgun, three-man rush for the Seminoles. And that one is short of the first down at the 46-yard line. The catch made by Carlos Perez. And that will bring up fourth down. It's a nice little change-up call by Mickey Andrews, defensive coordinator. Third down and eight. Rush three, drop eight, play zone, make him throw the football underneath. And that brings up a punting situation for Florida. There's Mickey Andrews, longtime aide to Bobby Bowden at Florida State, came in 1984. On fourth down, Eric Wilbur, the freshman, is back to punt. He has been a key part of this five-game win streak, averaging 45 yards per punt in the season. This one, the well-acknowledged pooch punt. And it is uh, effective inside the 15-yard uh, line. Wilbur, a freshman. 33 yards on the punt. Bobby Bowden, 74 years of age now. See Billy Sexton back there. Pulled a hamstring in the North Carolina State game while he was trying to accompany a running back on a 71-yard run. Ouch! Question, I guess, is did he catch it? <laughs> <laughs> First down and 10, Florida State. Florida State has run the ball 22 times. They've only thrown it five, but two touchdown passes by Chris Ricks. But this and a very important series right now for the Florida defense. They need a three and out with a minute 22 left in the half. They've got all three of their timeouts. If they can get a couple stops here, they can get the ball back to their offense. On the ground, that's Greg Jones left and uh, moves the ball effectively out to the 24-yard line. Well, time now for the answer to the half 
trivia question of the week. Florida State and Florida didn't play each other until 1958. And the reason, hmm, prior to 47, Florida State was an all-girls school. Florida State legislation forced the two teams to play in 58 when the Seminoles became competitive. They fielded their first football team in the late 40s. You don't think there was any trash talking about that? Oh, no. Oh, game, oh no. <laughs> First down and 10 after the 11-yard game by Jones. Final 45 seconds, Jones on the pitch. Johnny Lamar with the tackle. Well, this very solid FSU ground game set up the two touchdown passes. Yeah, and it's really the offensive line. I mean, I've been impressed with the Florida State offensive line, led by their junior center, David Castillo, who's been playing hurt all year. He's got foot injuries, ankle injuries, knee, hand. Number 63, I mean, he's bandaged up, padded up all over the place. But he has really led this group in there that has uh, controlled things up front for the Florida State Seminoles. Well, an effective first half for the Florida State Seminoles. They fell behind 3-0, but got a 35-yard strike from Chris Ricks to Dominic Robinson and have, for the most part, had things very much in command since that time. 17-6, they lead it. Ricks also found Matt Henshaw with a touchdown pass. Let's go down to Jill, who is with Ronzo. Right behind you. Well, Coach, it's been a very emotional and physical first half. You've gotten a lot of penalties. What will you do in the second half to gain the momentum? We just got to settle down and play. I mean, we've given them points, and, you know, it's, it's, we knew it was going to be that kind of game. Anytime you got a game like this, things like that happen. We've got to settle down and play. We're, we're fine. We're in good shape. We, this team is not going to panic. We haven't panicked before. We won't panic today. All right, Coach, thanks. Jill, thank you. 17-6 to six at the half. And we're going to spend the halftime back in New York with Tim Brendo. Let's go back to Tim right now. Tim, I agree with you. In this type of game, there's going to be ebb and flow, and that emotional pop was taken away. One thing's for sure, this ACC crew is not going to be getting any Christmas mm -hmm. cards from any of these Florida faithful. Still, seven different rushers for Florida State, and Florida hadn't been able to stop any of them. They've got to get stronger on the defense and shut down the run. You're right. Great game planning by Bowden's crew. Georgia in a big game against Georgia Tech today. And watch now, Spencer T off the play action fake. Boy, isn't that how you sell it, man? You have fooled everybody. Oh. David Green sitting back there, fights Fred Gibson 100%. That's good for 46 yard pickup. Then you come right back, David Green's going to show you I can scramble it big time as well. Takes a 7 0 lead here, fumbles it, but Johnny on the spot. Nick Jones recovering it. And again, you take a look at the outstanding work of Craig Lumpkin. This was after a block putt like we've ever said that before about a Mark Rick coach team. Now, David Green here is going to dump it to Lumpkin, who takes it in for a second touchdown. It was 34-10 at that point. A very big win for the Dogs to secure their BCS standing, which now is at 7 and could be getting higher. And Green was 16 of 22, 235. Looked like his old self in today's game. Tennessee had to get it done against the Big Blue today. And how about the power football? Fourth and goal in there, and it gets it in, punched up. They had him up seven to nothing. Then you come right back. Cedric Houston ran with heavy low pads today and got plus yardage here. One of his uh, 84 yards and a touchdown on the day. Casey Clawson doing it when he has to, as usual, rolling out. Finds Mark Jones in the end zone for an 18-yard score. Story in this game, missed opportunities for Kentucky. Turnovers by Lorenzen and Boyd. And here's Houston. This was a seven-minute drive that pretty much closed it out. And the Volunteers get the win. 20 to 7. Now, you look at the SEC East standings, a lot of ground for Florida to make up. And for obvious reasons, if this score holds up, the one that we have right now here on CBS, LSU's in trouble. It's, look, Georgia's sitting in that seven spot right now. That's not boding well for mm -hmm. LSU because if they should meet them in the SEC championship game, knocking them out of that top ten, they won't get those quality bumps there. So it's a very precarious situation for LSU. They lose strength of schedule. Oh, they already get rid of quality win component points because of the decision by the SEC about, few, uh, about four weeks ago. That SEC championship game, as you know, will be coming up here next week. Either one of those three teams, and right now it appears Georgia has the inside track against LSU, presented by Dr. Pepper, 8 Eastern Time. TCU and SMU tied at 10. Well, the old poster child for the have-nots perhaps deflated after that loss to uh, Southern Mississippi. 
The uh, Horn Frogs have won the last four meetings in a row. Boise State taking on Nevada. This is perhaps the best team you know the least about. On the blue field, David Michael catches the screen from Ryan Dinwiddie. Behind strong blocking, he gets into the end zone. 28 to nothing. Dinwiddie again going deep. And why not go deep? You're on a blue field. T.J. Eichery, 44 yards, playing for the right, by the way, to be back on that blue field in the Humanitarian Bowl, likely against Georgia Tech. 42 nothing now in the third in that game. West Virginia's Rich Rodriguez, what a job he's done. Seven consecutive wins. Without Quincy Wilson today, they bury Temple. You look at the Big East. Now, remember, the quirk in the conference tentacles of the BCS, they're instituting basically the same criteria that the SEC did for its title game, only this time it's for the bowl berth. If Pitt beats Miami tonight, they're in. If Miami wins, they're in. West Virginia goes to the Gators. Well, you have nothing to say about this other than the fact that it's a system that needs to be corrected right now. <laughs> I don't think Pittsburgh deserves to be in that position, despite that they played exceptional well so far this year, but you can't ignore yeah. what West Virginia has done this well, season. The Orange Bowl is going to lose a lot of crowd if they don't get West Virginia and have to settle on Pittsburgh. Virginia and Virginia Tech today. Well, Va Tech has lost four of the last five games, and today, Brian Randall finding Mike Emo here. He voids the tackle, goes all the way for the touchdown. Matt Shaw played well today. For Virginia, he did well. a great job of surveying down the field, throwing it up. I know early on, I'm gonna remind you of this. You thought he would be a, a big time player. Yes, I national did. championship. In I fact, think I things thought, do change. By the way, the crowd reacted after the game. You think Virginia did win the national <laughs> title for Al Groh today? That's uh, Wally Lundy, his fourth touchdown run of the day, 35 to 21. Well, coming up, we'll see how Gator Bowl bound Maryland is doing today, and Mizzou tries to have an eight win season, only the second time in 22 years. All when the Earthlink halftime report continues in a moment. My country left was ruled out of bounds. The later photographs were printed that clearly show Finner was in bounds. Florida wins at 22 to 19, and to this day, Florida State and the Seminole faithful do not acknowledge the loss. All right, Jill, thank you. Those are the days pre-instant replay, pre-videotape. The photographs seen.